we're just going to kick off on this uh, panel. I had... Who are you? Uh, Mike Check? Some guy. I'm Marv. Most people know me. If you don't, meet me later. Cool. Um, let's start off with... Mike closer to your mouth. Let's uh, start off with Grifter. You might know Grifter from such hits as uh, Trevor Forget, the documentary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also runs the Black Cat Knock, Def Con Goon for a million years. 20. 20 years. Yeah. Oh. Uh, black hat aficionado is in actual black hats. I don't yes. think I've ever seen him with any other color hat. No. Um, you also might know him from the ZCMI food court 2600 meetings. <laughs> Depending Dang, on how long you've known bro. Him. Dating me real hard there. <laughs> <laughs> and Snow. Snow is a black badge winning social engineer. And uh, you may have seen Snow asking for entry into your data center because we forgot your badge. And uh, I guess Lean. You might know Lean. Probably not. I know Lean. Or Keho. He okay, loves that. Yeah. Keho. So this is just going to be a kind of rambly conversation. A bunch of friends up on stage uh, more than anything. Um, overall, uh, our our goal with B-Side Salt Lake City is, you know, trying to lift people up, bring them in, things like that. So we'll touch on that, but also story time with Grifter, Snow, and Lean. So good, good stories, or doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. I mean, your stories are always a little sketch anyway. Yeah, my, my story. Yeah, that's what they want to hear. They want to hear. I the guarantee stuff. it. They want to hear the sketchy. <laughs> There's a podcast for that. <laughs> I'm not signing up. All right, fire away, Mark. What All right. You got? Uh, so first, uh, yeah, what's the last 21 months been like for you guys? Hmm. Who's, go, who's going for? All right, I'll I go think first. You are. Um, it's been sad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the easiest way to put it. Um, I'm a people person. I like traveling. I like being around coworkers and and things like that. So being stuck at home um, is it's it's changed a lot, right? So I'm so excited to be here today that things are opening back up. Uh, a lot to look forward to. But I think in general, it's it sucked, right? I don't I don't know how to spin it in a good way, honestly. <laughs> But yeah, that's, yeah. that's my take. I think, uh, yeah, for me, it was the same thing. So I also, I'm a road warrior, pro traveler or whatever, right? Um, in 2019, I flew over a quarter million miles. And then in 2020, clearly everything stopped, right? So it was really weird, um, one, for my family to see me and be like, shouldn't you go like somewhere? Don't you have a plane to get on? Um, so yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, but like you said, things are opening back up in the last two months. Um, I've spoken at four conferences, St. Con, just right here, um, Black Hat in London. And then uh, I just got back from Riyadh for At Hack um, last night. So I'm really tired. Yeah, what, what time are you on right now? I, yes. Whatever time. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then now here. Right? We call so that so things are opening back up, which is nice. So it's good to see people and, and reconnect. Yeah, the same thing. It's it's been interesting to to realize how much we took for granted uh, our our interactions and at conferences. Most of us go to conferences multiple times a year, see a lot of people interact in the community, and uh, when that stopped, initially it was nice because it's like, oh hey, I, my family, I get to see them again, or or get to actually do home projects. Um, but then it slowly started to to kind of. Uh, breakdown where I wasn't progressing as much as I had previously because most of my career progression has been networking and community and, and, and connections and so I started stagnating and realizing like oh man I'm I need to get out and talk to people again I, I feel like I'm losing my my mind and in, in my education and so being able even just sync on this year has been such an, uh, a relief to be like oh yeah I feel that knowledge just absorption again is really nice because the way I've always seen it is just surround myself with people who are really, really smart, and I might be able to grab like 5% of that. That's how I've kind of grown my career, so. Yeah, I totally agree, because that's the, that's the thing, is like getting out, I, I feel like that's how you level up, right, is you find yourself around people who know more than you, which is what I've done essentially my entire career, and I highly, highly recommend that um, for all of you as well. Um, if you are the smartest person in the room, that's the wrong room, right, so find the next room. Uh, with smarter people because they will lift you up whether you realize it or not just from the conversations that you're having you'll 
hear somebody say something and so you're like wait what was that what is that thing and not having those interactions has been incredibly difficult and i think yeah a little bit maybe um, mentally stunting <laughs> so, so i can tell you from my own experience in the last uh, uh you know two years that as a security professional our job is to talk to people and when you're not in the room those conversations take on a very different tone. How did you guys um, tackle that? I mean, uh, especially as somebody who travels you know, yeah. professionally as much as you do. I was gonna say, so, um, so with my role, I would go out to organizations, so um, I just do threat hunting, I'm a threat hunter, right? And so I would go on site to organizations and I would sit down with their security team in a room and say, okay, let's talk about one, how the network is set up or like how, what, what do you have deployed? Those types of things. And we'd have those conversations face to face, right? So you're sitting there looking at somebody and you're discussing what their security posture is. They're telling you about the different technologies that they have. All of those things are happening in a room. Um, the problem with Zoom and things like that is one, not everybody turns on their camera. So you don't see body language, that kind of stuff all the time either. But also, at least I have found, and I realized how valuable it actually was to be on location, is that you'll hear somebody say, oh yeah, we do that. And then like someone two seats over starts getting real uncomfortable, like in their seat, right? And over Zoom, you don't, notice that as much or you will take that like oh okay we're going to take 10 minutes for a bio break uh, during your conversation and everybody runs off and pees and then you're standing around in the hallway or you get back to the conference room before things kick off and someone says in reality it's more like this those are invaluable bits of information that don't happen when you're not sitting in a room together and so not having that that's, yeah, I didn't realize how important that was until it wasn't there. And, and so face-to-face -face still does matter because there's an, a, a significant amount, and especially someone, I mean, you're a professional social engineer, so you know body language, like reading body language and micro expressions in people's face, like you'd see this like really fleeting, like mm, this cringe when somebody said something that just wasn't true, you know, <laughs> like from other people in the room. And you don't have that over Zoom. Yeah, I don't think you can replace that. Even if everyone had their camera on, there's, there's just that, that aspect to it that you can't replace. So that's been a struggle. And then from a testing or consulting point of view, um, not being able to actually do physical assessments has been um, not fun because you can't go inside. And that's like the best part of your job. It is. It is the most like tangible, right? Like actually stealing things. But yeah, yeah I can't do that right now. You can't do a data center social engineer over Zoom? No. I like, I like how much that tells us about actually, you, is that you're like, the thing I missed the most was stealing. Like, you know, like Pretend stealing. stealing. Yeah. Have you guys seen Community, where they have um, the robots the show community, yes. um, they had the robots and the screen. They had like remote um, students. I don't know. You gave me an idea. Did, do you have a, idea. a shelf of trophies for your from your engagements? No. Unofficial trophies. No. Oh, okay. My mom asked me that once. She's like, "What do you take?" I'm like, "I don't take anything." You, I mean, I do. A, I a lock of their hair. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> I'm like, not a serial killer. <laughs> I take a little bit of the CISO's hair. <laughs> well, and I guess that. Uh, when you do get those physical engagements and you don't have anybody working on site, <laughs> you don't have anybody to piggyback or, or steal their creds. It makes things difficult for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, Lean and I were actually working on a, a project together, professionally, at the very beginning of this. And it certainly went off the rails when we weren't meeting yeah. together and we weren't doing things. So it definitely affected us. The hardest part was not being able to just whiteboard. like. Digital whiteboards don't work. Nope. Um, and even when you get into a room of you know five, six people, there, there's multiple conversations going on at the same time. And so uh, the, the interesting thing at the start was everyone was like, oh, I get to have more meetings because I go back to back without drive time or you know any of that. But that quickly turned into quite the psychological trauma where you didn't even have five minutes between meetings for, to go grab water. Um, and so uh, while most of our uh, management thought we were being more efficient. It was actually more psychologically draining and, and burnout happened faster for a lot of people.
Now, with all that said, uh, there has to be some wins in the last two years. Yeah, I think that people started realizing the, that the uses of technologies could be, um, there were many different uses that weren't being utilized. Um, I, I do like uh, being able to communicate with uh, teams in other states that would not talk to me previously, and they had no choice. Um, and, and also, when you start not being able to go on, on site, you start coming up with creative ways to stay connected. So virtual lunches, just to sit and talk, we have more of those than if I were to go on site and, and talk to, to, to different customers because um, I work in the consultant side of the house. And so being able to just connect with more people uh, across the country faster without having to hop on a plane, as much as I love traveling, uh, was really nice. And so really creative uses of technology. Yeah, I, I echo that for sure. Definitely um, team members that I normally don't get to talk to as much. Um, we do a lot more happy hours and things like that. So it's it's been beneficial from a team building perspective, um, especially for remote people. So um, that has been a win, I think. Yeah, same thing. I think it's just the, uh, the overall getting more comfortable with things like like people seeing into your office or whatever at home. Like I have a home you, office. You don't blur that out. No, I don't. I let people see it. You, you actually know what? Have presented very yeah, well. Yeah, like I have what is essentially a shrine to ADHD behind me. Like I have shelves of like all the random crap that I have collected over years. And like I collect these mini arcade machines and those are on and flashing and there's all kinds of, and I love Harry Potter stuff because I'm a giant child. And there's all this stuff like movie props. And I, but the favorite is I have a working, a functioning payphone like in my office and people are like, is that a payphone? Like, and I'm like, you bet your ass it's a payphone. You just gotta find. Like, is that find work? I'm like, yes, it works. What would be the point? Find the number. Call him when he's on his ex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the hard part is if you're on the other end of that, where you're talking to Grifter, and you can only see the things in the background. <laughs> the ADD on my side. Yeah, it is fun. You're like, what? People are always. What is that? What's that thing over there? Yeah. I was like, I'll do like a cribs of my office at some point. You whatever. need to because what ends up happening is it's 15 minutes of actual conversation and then 45 minutes of cribs. Joe yeah, it's like yeah. talking. It's like talking to Pope. Like he's hiding behind the camera there. But when you're on with Pope, he's got like dinosaur teeth and like whatever. It's like looking into like a museum. You're like, what is that? Did you get a new tooth? Like you know, it's like. <laughs> I do. I, I like that. I don't know. I'm creepy. I like it too. Yeah. like that, I guess. It's like, oh, look at how nice your living room's decorated. Yeah. Or you, you love the pottery barn. Did, can your kid hear us? Because this is a pretty heated conversation. No, they're fine. Go back to Peppa Pig. You know? Actually, that is a nice thing. I know you're saying that like as a joke, but also um, that like life happens around you while you're working as well, right? And so things like like my office happens to be below the kitchen. So sometimes it's it's the worst place for an office, but it's what I got. And so sometimes it'll just be like, crash, you know, like and all of the pots have fallen out of a cabinet or something above my head while I'm on a meeting. And I'm just like, shrug. What happens is you're, you're mid-sentence and then you pause and everyone on the call knows why. And then it's, do you hear any crying? <laughs> yeah. Nope, all right, we can continue our meeting. Right, so it's kind of cool. It like humanized yeah. like yeah. your coworkers yeah. and everything. Like It's like, oh, the, we all do have lives outside of this. We're just dogs barking and stuff like that. Oh, I love and, seeing animals like just on screen, like behind people. I'm like, I don't know what you're saying anymore. I'm looking at your animals. Is yeah. that a bird? Yeah. yeah. It's a bird? <laughs> yeah. Just let them fly around? Full on parrots, yeah. And it's, it's fun because you get to see some of the more personal sides of, of people's lives and the, maybe their choices in 3D printers. May not be the best, and so you get to talk smack about that. I feel seen. <laughs> I blur my camera <laughs> for that reason. Uh, but it's it's very interesting to see you know that side of the the, the, the coin. But one thing that it did do uh, because it was just an expectation that you know you're remote and you're on on virtual meetings. It opened up the job market in a way we've never seen before, um, for better and worse. Um, so you're able to expand outside of the, the place that you live. So people that were living in remote areas were able to get different jobs, because now companies are saying, well, we have no choice but to go remote, so we might as well try and, and, and poach from the best. Um, that also comes at the downside of you're losing candidates to out-of-market uh, um, opportunities. You know, I'll actually, I'll comment on that really quickly, if, if I may. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so that, I changed jobs just recently, only a few months ago. And if for the first time in, I, I, the company I was with, I was with for, for nine years. Um, so, which is an eternity, right, in, in our industry. Um, but 
during the like it was like oh they were like oh we want to send you an offer and all this stuff and they talking about salaries and things like that they i said well here's what i want and they said well based on your region this is what we do and where and i had to like and i'm talking to the recruiter and i said it's 2021 like does it does it matter where i live like i don't like it's not that's not relevant anymore, right? Is the data that is in my head that you're interested in paying me to get worth less because of the region that I'm living in versus if I lived in San Francisco or whatever? And they're like, well, cost of living and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. I'm still on the same meetings, talking to the same customers. I will be on the same Zoom, regardless of whether I'm in LA, New York, Oklahoma, or Salt Lake City, and they were like, fair play, <laughs> right? But it took having that conversation, and that's a conversation that's easier to have now. So when you are looking at new jobs and things, and they come at you and say, well, you're in Utah, and so the cost of living, and I'm like, one, you don't realize how much the cost of living has gone up in Utah in the last several years, thanks California, um, for all moving here during the pandemic, uh, but, also, again, companies are interested in what you know. It should have nothing to do with where you live. So negotiate, you know, with that in mind. That changes monthly too. Cost of living in, in Salt Lake specifically is going up monthly. And, and I don't think that recruiters and HR teams are even able to keep up with that data. And so um, the biggest aha for me during the pandemic was what are you really worth? I don't think anybody knows what they're really worth until you start having these conversations. It's not a comparison of you versus the engineer and your peer and your organization, who knows more, um, or even where you're located. It's what are you providing to the organization? And if they don't value that, someone else will. And I'm not encouraging everyone to go jump ship and whatnot, but, but understand. I am. <laughs> go. Only. <laughs> like, for if you have talent, like right now, like seriously, the skills gap is so immense that like if you have marketable skills, like you can just, you can go where, if you're unhappy and you have marketable skills, you don't need to be unhappy, go somewhere else, like you can get a job. That brings up something that uh, I did want to talk about, which is, you know, there very much is a skills gap in our industry and you three each are in kind of unique positions that aren't the standard, this is an InfoSec person job, um, what are the resources? What are the ways that you would encourage people to get a start or skill up if that's where they want to pivot? I, I can go. go. I, do you want me? Okay. You, you had your microphone up before I did. I have a lot of thoughts. So sure. you're going to need to inject. Yep. We're at a different stage of our careers where what worked for me is not going to work for anybody else. The industry has changed. I was very fortunate to be in a very unique position and that honestly is what propelled my career. That doesn't work today. Um, the skills gap is creating such an employee market that you have any specialty, any skill set, you should be able to find a job. Um, it's in, there's such a shortage of InfoSec um, skills, even general IT skills, that it wouldn't take long for you to focus on a particular skill, get very good at it, and find an opportunity. Um, that wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. You had to prove your worth, you had to come up and uh, be the junior, and then learn all of the, the fundamentals. I also think that's creating a, a whole different problem that we'll get into in a little while, but um, the, the thing I always say is if someone says, well, is it too late to switch to security? No, just pick the next technology that's coming out that no one else knows, brain dump the heck out of that and you'll have a job because no one else is able to keep up at the pace of change that is happening in our industry. And so wh whether you feel like you might not have the fundamentals or the education or the experience to get a job, um, there is enough out there. You can, if you want to stay local, find all of the opportunities that are local, find what they're looking for, and there's likely a shortage in that position, and you should be able to go find a ton of free resources, whether it's you know GitHub awesome lists or YouTube, or even pay for for things like 
Pluralsight or Cloud Guru or any of those if you want to go into the cloud. Just it's not too expensive. You don't need to go through a four-year degree to just get in. I'm not saying that that's not valuable because it is, but um, you can break into the market very quickly because what happens is once you're in, if you are job hopping every few years, not that that's recommended, you will constantly be going up every time you switch positions. Um, whether it's your experience is growing or your skill set's growing and you are now no longer providing value to your company or you feel overqualified, you can go find another opportunity. I wouldn't recommend chasing the money because at the end of the day, you're going to end up in a position where you have just gaps everywhere and you're not going to have a well-rounded skill set. Um, but for the first few years to break into it, it's find the next greatest technology that someone is, is coming out with and just brain dump it. That's probably the fastest way to get into it. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And something you mentioned is right now you shouldn't have a hard time finding a job, right? They're they're everywhere. They're, it's easier to get. But folks that I talk to that tend to have issues getting jobs, I think they're getting in the way of themselves. They're looking at job requirements, which Colin talked about uh, the the sorry the presentation before this. I haven't qualified 100% for any role that I've had but that doesn't stop me from applying or from talking to HR. So that's one of the things I wanted to make sure you all think about is if you're looking at jobs, don't let the requirements stop you, still apply. Um, Cause I think people get in the way of themselves, unfortunately, way too often. Yeah, I think um, actually Pope offers a service called the old bald white man service where it's what would an old bald white dude do? And uh, they would just be like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, this is how much I want. Like with that old, bald, white dude confidence that only comes from being that, right? So if you're not an old, bald, white dude, reach out to Pope. He will give you advice on how to, to go forward in your career with that, that level of bravado. Um, there, there is something to say about, and this is going to sound really bad, the fake it till you make it does apply, but I don't like that it leads to... The, the imposter syndrome problem that we have. Don't fake it till you make it and then cause problems and pretend that you know more than you do. Be humble and be honest about it, but just you do need to have a level of confidence of, you know, no, I don't know. I'm going to go figure that out. But yes, you, you kind of need to lead it on as, yeah, I can, I can solve that problem. I don't know the answer, but I can solve that problem. And Pope actually gives quite a lot of good information because a decade ago, I don't know how long I've known you, um, he looked at me and, and he was like, you know, if I want to go look for a job, I just you could search a certification and how many results pop up on Indeed. And we had this conversation. The CISSP, and this is when we were talking about what certs are relevant. He says, it doesn't matter if the cert is actually good. It's just a matter of who's looking for those certs because that means that you are a better candidate for those positions. Um, so it's a very interesting perspective that I got. So I started doing that. And I'm like, you know, a lot of the certs that I didn't really think I valued, there, were a, there was high demand for. And whether I valued it or not, that means that there are people out there looking and seeking for these, these roles. Um, whether they understand the certs or not is a whole different problem. But at least they're out there. And so if you do have a challenge getting into a position, maybe it's start with some of the certifications that people are asking for and just go get those. Whether you think you're going to use them or not, break into the organization because what will happen more than not, often than not is once you're in, people realize how good you are at just solving problems. And then it doesn't matter what the search you have, they're just going to ask you to go do these things. And you'll likely be pushed into other positions just because you're able to solve complex problems, not because you have the certification that says you can. Uh, you said break in, and Snow was like, yeah, yeah. break let's, in. Let's go. Where are we going? Where are we going? <laughs> Once you're in, they can't make you leave. Like, no. <laughs> Unless they push the uh, EPO button and fire suppression system comes. Is that how they get that, you out of the building? Now, how do they get you out of She's the She's in the building? data center. We'll just, oh. Sorry, She's I know, I know Mara's moderating, but, but yeah. yeah, how do they get you out once you're in? I'll leave on my own terms. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a definition of my own terms? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, lunch. Uh, that, that brings up um, a couple of things for me because you know, a lot of this resonates with how I've gotten roles. Um, Though I've tried to move into, when, I, when I'm looking at a new role, what do I get out of it? And um, the role that I recently took, I learned more about routing in Linux just to pass the interview than I ever thought I would need. Like, what's the most left field way that you've learned something new relevant to your job recently? It's, 
I, I think that's a very valid uh, point, really quick to touch on that. What are you going to get out of the job? Um, a lot of people don't ask themselves that. Most of it's people say, oh, I need a job so I can get money and, and I'm chasing that, that figure in my head and that's how I want to grow my career. I've been a v big fan of if you feel stagnant or that you're not growing in a position, it's time to move on. Whether you're benefiting the organization or not, that's great, if, unless they're compensating you heavily for it. You should be always growing your career, your skills, um, even into retirement. Um, listening to a podcast this morning where someone says, you know, the average retirement age, 60s, um, but our life expectancy is in the 80s, what happens? People still want to provide value in their 50s and 60s, so it's never too late to continuously grow. And if you're stagnant and you don't feel like you're growing in a position, it's likely time to move on. The flip side of that is if you're new to the industry, finding career opportunities that are going to propel you exponentially, whether they come at a lower salary or uh, entry cost, keep that in mind. Don't just go in saying, I need X number of dollars to pay the bills. Think about the, the other variables that, that might apply where this position gives me opportunity to learn so many different things, and that's worth twenty, thirty thousand dollars of school of schooling, right? Th that's a, a variable that needs to be applied to your calculation that, that I can sit here for two years and the exposure I get in this organization is going to net me a 2x on my salary jump in the next position. Yeah, I think also like that's a, an important point is to find something that challenges you. You could go out and find something that is just easy to do and pays well or whatever, but at, at the end of the day, you will find yourself unfulfilled. Um, I, I highly recommend, and, and what's cool about where security has come in in the last you know 20 years or whatever, it's like when, when I started out, um, <clears throat> you were just a generalist, right? You had to do all of the things. It wasn't siloed as much as it is today. The fact that we have those, those specializations is fantastic because there were parts of security that I just hated, right? Um, and now you can say, okay, here's the thing I want to do because that's the thing that challenges me. That's what makes me want to do this job. And so you gain satisfaction from that. If you are, if you're just doing something that's easy, um, you can only do it for so long before you're like, okay, well, now I'm getting up and I'm just pushing the button like over and over every day. And that, um, it, it kind of crushes your spirit after yeah. a while. Like regardless of whether, even if it pays well, if you don't have you that. Get anything out of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. For me, find the thing that you're excited about that challenges you and then and do that. And it's one of those like you get paid not. I feel like I get paid to, to do what I love anyway, so. Yeah, and I think one of the ways to avoid even getting in that situation is when you're looking at a new company and you're interviewing with them, don't let them interview you, you interview them. That's such a big part of it and I think a lot of people might be missing is you need to make sure that you know, it lives up to your standards. You're gonna be challenged. You know what progression, career progression looks like. So I think you could actually go into a career with avoiding some of these issues um, just by kind of setting things up front um, so everyone's on the same level. Yes, please do that. Like, understand that. I Because I literally, I had this experience before um, before I came into the new role um, that, I, that I'm in now with IBM X-Force. Like, I, another company reached out to me and where they were like, oh, we want you to, like, build out our security program, do this. They, um, And we were having discussions. And at one point they said to me, um, and this might be the like old balding white dude like confidence or whatever, but um, I, like they were like, oh, well, we'd want to see how you handle this, that, or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's really getting into the area of consulting. And I'm, I, if you want to pay me to do that, we can talk about it. But and they're like, well, we're we're interviewing you. And I genuinely, I literally said, oh, no, I think you misunderstand. I'm interviewing you to see if I want to come work for your company. Like, this is not, like I'm not just going to do something because you're telling me it's part of the interview process. I'm trying to decide whether I see value in working for you. Um, again, I don't, I don't know if that's some of that Pope confidence or whatever, but, <laughs> um, but I, 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 had to, I had to draw that line. I was like, you're coming to me and asking me to come and give you a significant amount of my time and what is really just your waking hours in your life, um, I want to make sure that this is a, a beneficial thing for, for both of us. And so, so 
don't go into interviews being like, oh no, I really, I, they, I gotta get this, they got, no, they've gotta get you and go in there with that attitude and, um, and hopefully you'll find the thing that works for you. This is what happens when you're in an employee's market. Right? I feel like InfoSec specifically is negative unemployment right now. Sure. And if, when it is, don't be the millennial that's like, I gotta have my 10 a.m. coffee break. I'm, I'm gonna start work at noon. Like, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about no. when you're interviewing a company, it's, okay, what is your career progression path? Do you have one? Do you have a junior training program? Do you have certifications that you cover every year? What's the, the dollar amount? Can I go take a SANS course, or am I going to get compensated for the CompTIA exam? Yeah, what Didymus does that look was, like? We had that stuff up there on the yeah. on the slide where he's like, "Oh yeah, you know, what's your experience?" And it's like, "Well, okay, well, we hope to help you grow that." That's one of those things. Those certifications are up there. Um, make them pay for it. Yeah. How many organizations are there? Like, find the one that's willing to pay for the SANS course, right? Don't drop that six grand yourself. Have somebody pay for that. Uh, keep in I have yet to pay for a cert. Yeah, and keep right. in mind, and will, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your experience is. That I am gesturing to the previous speaker. <laughs> he's he's uh, he's off camera, <laughs> like, but he's over here. Yeah, <laughs> we need a mother like, too. But but I mean, would you agree? Like finding an organization that yeah, I'll, so I'll always they find get one. them to pay for it. Even if that's going to come at a cost of you having to sit there for a year or two, right? Some of them say, you know, for every twenty five hundred dollars that we're going to contribute to your education, you need to give us one year back. That's fine. Because now you have in your, in your head, I am getting this out, this, this is the value I'm getting back for contributing to this organization for two years. And I've done that as well. I've had to go two years for SAN certs, et cetera. And, and, and that's, that's another variable of if you're going up against a couple of companies that are all looking to hire you, you could say, well, this one's gonna offer it, but I have to stick around for two years. Maybe you could do it for a little less. You can play those games a little bit, but definitely make sure that you're interviewing them. You're asking for what certifications they're gonna cover. If there's other opportunity to move laterally within the organization, if you're uncomfortable. You know, if it's a, I come in, I don't like this job, don't necessarily just leave. Just see if they have uh, the appetite to move to a different position. Also very valuable, because that's how you, you, you want to build that relationship with your employer that, you're going to give them uh, as much effort as possible if they're going to take care of you as you grow your career. And often you'll find that they'll help you grow as much as you want, even paying for, for full degrees. All right, I that didn't actually answer your original question. I feel like this is like the hacker job fair. What else, what do you got for yeah. us? What do you got? <laughs> What do you got outside? It's a bunch of, of questions that actually Lean gave me. Um, oh, I was just joking on some of those, but let's go. Those are the worst let's ones. Uh, starting with snow. Uh, I'm just kidding. No, the one that I liked uh, is the, you didn't like the rest? why I don't want to be an ex. Like, um, oh. why, why wouldn't you want to be a pen tester or a consultant or a threat hunter, like let's hear the, the dirty, the... To, 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 quali or to provide some backstory here, we all work in different areas of the industry. So I, I have very, uh, uh, my perspective of your side of the house yeah. is very different than your perspective of mine. So this will be fun. Why I don't want to be a pen tester, why I don't want to be a SOC analyst, that's kind of where I was going with the intent of that question because I feel that what we've run into now is uh, a lot of people entering into the market jump into the, I'm gonna hack, I'm gonna be a red teamer. Why have you thought that through? Do you understand the complexities of that? Okay, fine, I wanna be a SOC analyst. Are you aware that's not a tier one position? Like that's not an entry level position. Um, there's a lot of these things that the industry as a whole we can't agree on. And so um, I was hoping to have a dialogue on um, why wouldn't we want to do a specific um, job over another as we're growing our careers or getting into the space? Okay, so I'm going to take that, but I'm going to take it a little bit of a different approach. So I'm going to look at it more from a consulting versus working in an internal organization. Um, kind of pros and cons of both. Now, I have seen people that start off with internal, working internal, whether it's red or blue side, and then they move to consulting and it is a game changer, right? It's not, the pace is completely different. You have one client, you normally have a couple weeks, months, whatever it is, you have to pump out a report and next you're going. And if you're a consultant right now, it's key for like thoughts and prayers. I'm so sorry for you all. You shouldn't be in this room. Yeah. <laughs> you should be working. Yeah, I'm like they're, they're not here, emails actually. right now, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I think that there's definitely pros and cons. I think entering into the field, I honestly think consulting, because it's, in my opinion, a little bit more stressful, um, would be a good way to start, right? You're, you're kind of 
getting in there and you're you're being put to the test and then moving more towards an internal role. That's that's just my thoughts. I can see both sides honestly, but that's kind of Yeah, I think I think like as as an example to 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 that is like being an incident response, right? So I'm on the blue team side of the house now. Um, I come from a red team background. Well, to be fair, my intro to the industry is that I just committed crimes for a decade. Um, and then uh, and then it turned into a career that was more savory. Uh, but, <laughs> like, but the, um, let's say your incident response. If you're internal incident response, then your task with making sure that all the mitigations that your organization has put into place are effective in keeping um, the, the bad guys or threat actors out, right? That's incredibly stressful when you think about like, okay, um, did we do everything right today? Did anybody get in today? Did all of the alerts fire that should have? That kind of stuff. Um, where, if you're doing consulting as incident response, you get a phone call that says, such and such organization has been breached. We Friday need... at 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, always. But such and such organization has been bre uh, breached. We need you to come in and like either like supplement that organization or you are the incident responders now and you have to come in and figure out more investigatory like what happened and how do we get back to normal. Now you weren't responsible for that breach or part of the responsible party for that breach. So your level of stress is a little bit different, right? Because it's not your organization. So somebody's not like, oh, you work for XYZ organization? Oh, you guys got popped. Now you're saying like, oh no, I was on the team who helped them get right. So you can be an incident response, but the roles, or whether you're in consulting or sitting behind the keyboard in that organization become totally different. Now, as a consultant though, you go into an organization after a breach, and this is where for, for me, oh, by the way, hi, I'm Grifter. Um, I am the global lead for active threat assessments for IBM X4. So that means essentially our threat hunting for, for companies um, going in and seeing if an attacker exists within an environment without evidence already that they're there, right? So we go in and, and do threat hunting. We go in and check to see if, if somebody's in that environment. Having the responsibility at the end of that engagement to say, there are no attackers currently persisting within your environment is incredibly stressful because what you're doing is putting your name down and saying, we have done everything and we have used our resources and skills to determine that there is not an attacker within this environment or after a breach, the attacker is no longer within the environment and we have shored up your defenses so that they will remain out um, for nebulous time period. I just, I'm like sweating listening to you right? say that. Like exactly. It's nerve wracking. So it is stressful in different ways. Um, that, I think that piece of it is why if I was like playing devil's advocate and being like, don't go into incident response or don't go into like threat hunting or whatever, ha unless you can say, I can handle the stress of going, this house is clear, right? Like that that, well, <laughs> man, that's heavy. That's heavy when you do that and you tell a customer, yeah, you're good. Why I don't want to be X just turned into why I don't want to be a grifter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even though my bio says otherwise if you read it. <laughs> that's exactly right, though, is on the consultant side of the house is, is not to back up, you, you gave me an interesting perspective. I, I came from the customer side, I should say, the, the institution side, and grew up in 15 years in, in that space, and I'm now on the consultancy side, and. I don't know if I'd want to go the other direction. That scares the heck out of me. But to your point, uh, that stress or that expectation, when you come in as a consultant, you are expected to be the expert. That's very stressful. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to do that out of the gate. Um, but that also means that you're pushed every single day to learn. So the whole, it's a whole other level of, of growth on the consultant side where you usually get access to resources to learn and grow because you are expected to be the expert and to say, your house is clear. And in order to do that, you have to have a constant state of, of development in your own personal skill sets. And so it's a very interesting and exciting side to be in. Um, but why I don't want to do that would be the stress um, because you, at the end of the day, have to be the one that puts on paper with your name whatever the report that you're delivering says. And if that's not accurate, they come back in six months and says, huh, actually, uh, plot twist, they were in our environment for another eight months after that, like, whoops you know, that's on you. So, and that, that's not just with IR, really. Any engagement you do in the consultant side of the house, if you don't deliver it right, 
can lead to problems later on because they're expecting that whatever you put in the report is exactly what happened or is in place or is architected or is configured. So be aware of that. We also get into a scope issue, right? You're doing a pen test and half of their IPs are out of scope and you say they're good to go, you know, you don't find that many vulnerabilities, they think they're good. They're, they don't remember that they have that out of scope. Or you have a certain amount of hours to test in, right? Attackers don't. So you that, that's have favorite. that working against you. Like, there's a lot. When you only have like a 40 to 80 hour engagement and you're like, yeah, you're clean for the 80 hours that I tested you. No one puts that in the report or tells that to leadership. They just said, we had a pen test, we're clean even though you might actually have evidence that the out-of-scope uh, IPs have information that is easily accessible, um, but you just can't touch it because of the scope. So scope is always fun. There is never any scope. Again, probably didn't answer your question. Oh, that's fine. This is an entertaining Usually is. We're just going to give yeah. the answers Now we all stressed ourselves out. <laughs> now I'm just like completely stressed out. Now Grifter's going to be box. <laughs> all right, so let's pivot a little bit. Um, what is... What is the uh, the way that you make your jobs have fun? Like, we all need something that uh, keeps us involved that is, you know, not exactly what we do for our day job. Isn't it? Snow breaks into companies for a living. What's not fun about that? <laughs> These two found jobs that I actually really enjoy no matter what. <laughs> because at the end of the day, they could say, uh, yeah, you're vulnerable, or here is your data center badge, or yes, we, we found this, have a nice day. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, after you've done your job in the consultant world, you kind of move on to the next problem. You don't have to drag that out, and so that's fun. That's fun that you don't have to think about yeah. it for six months. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> another way that I make my job more enjoyable is I love training. So we have interns, apprenticeships, co-ops, externships, a lot of ships, um, but I love being involved in training new people. It's like one of my passions, so that's definitely a way where I'm able to knowledge share and then see people grow, um, so that's one of the ways I absolutely love. That's a good way to put it, like mentorship. As you're progressing your career, um, find a mentor and, and be a mentor um, is really critical because you can be both at the same time. What I really enjoy about my job is, or how I keep my job fun, is when I find an area that I don't want to work in, I can hopefully try and bring someone else into that that is really excited about it. So I, one of my skill sets is finding people, finding opportunities and connecting them. I don't need to do the work. And so I'm, I, that's what I feel I'm really good at. And as a result, I get to work on things that are enjoyable from like a high level architecture perspective, but I know that there is an engineer that really wants to get into the details and I can say, there you go. And I get to move on and back to the next happy job or next project. So that's how I enjoy my job and, and keep it fun. I just, I just really like finding attackers who are hiding really well, right? And then when you have that, that kind of like aha moment when you see something and you're like, I got you, sucker, right? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I really enjoy that. Like, there is that, um, I don't know, like, you, you feel you're an investigator, right? Like, and I mean, in the nerdiest way possible, but you're an investigator. So I get that, like, Sherlock Holmes moment where it's like you see that, that breadcrumb that you start to follow, and, and it leads you to an attacker hanging out in an environment. Um, I, I just I get a rush from that. What I about, think I probably like, always will. bad attackers with, like, I mean, bad OPSEC, like, really obvious Oh yeah, well that that's fun too. Like I mean, finding stuff where you're just like, how, like, where you go, how did no one see this? Right? Like they're literally just stomping all over the place. Um, you know, I'm just waiting for a grifter takedown video where he joins the FBI on a raid. Well, no, like, I found so, you, and I'm going to knock on the door. So I mean, uh, uh, Pope and I were hunters together at, at RSA before we've gone on to to different places, but um, but. One of the most like kind of moments where you just go like that just happened um, is when you're and I know you've had this experience just in the last couple of weeks because we talked about it. But um, where you go to demonstrate what you're about to do, like you're trying to explain to somebody like what a threat hunt is, right? And and what the actions are that you're going to take to hopefully find whether or not an attacker is within the environment. And so you give them an example of something really simple where you just go like let's look at this and there and you're like okay boom and then you go 
well, that's weird. And then you start to go, and you find an attacker within moments of arriving on site. Like there's, so, so that happens. Pumping those ROI numbers, right? Yeah, so, so, like, so there are times where it's like blindingly obvious. Um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll story time with Grifter for like, you know. Um, you know, no, you know, I won't. Let's, we'll save story times for the, let's do hallway con. Yeah. The, the, the common theme con. there though is the best dopamine hits come from a lot of stress. So to keep your job exciting and interesting, it may be counterintuitive to say, this really sucks, I'm gonna keep pushing through, but once you get that aha moment, yeah. or you get over that hump, that's the best endorphin so rush. It's, yeah, and it just keeps you going. So don't avoid the stressful or the, the difficult just because it's boring or monotonous or not fun, because it will get you to that next level of, oh man, that was amazing, where's the next one? Well, we, we've got about, uh, Probably five more minutes. Time so. check. What's that? That's a time check because we'll keep going. <laughs> um, we've got three great storytellers up here. Does anybody have questions for these people? I was like, don't raise your hand, Pope, because but there's you know, a mic right behind Pope. So this is a question for all of you, but particularly for Snow. What is the most absolutely whack, you didn't think it was going to work thing that you tried that ended up working? Okay, so this was actually the last physical pen test that I did um, right before COVID hit. It was the first week of March in New York City. I was in the county I was in, uh, it was like during the, when everything, their first case broke out, so everyone was freaking out. But the thing that I did, I didn't think was gonna work. So. I was breaking into the building, and I found online they had a form to print out and fill out information to get a guest badge. You didn't even have to go through um, any, any like logins or anything. It was just online. So I printed it out. I filled out my information, and I showed up to the security guard to see if he'd give me a guest badge, and he did, and I was really excited. So I kind of thought that might work, and it worked. But this is the cool part. The next day, what I did is the pass was, it was just a paper. Um, so what I did the next day is I just cut out a piece of paper from my hotel room, like the little cards. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna see if this works. If I just flash this to him, nothing is on it and see if he'll still let me in. I'm like, okay, he's gonna catch that. And he didn't, so I still got to go in. So that was, that was a pretty exciting one. Like psychic paper, like you were yeah. Doctor yeah, Who. Yeah, the Doctor just, Who trick, yeah. Yep. In, in you went. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess, so So mine also comes from, a, um, so I still do consulting, like red team stuff, because it's just fun. Um, so while I live on the blue team side of the house, most of the time I still like to break into places. Um, and in this one particular engagement, we had um, essentially access to not only their surveillance system, but also all of the electronic locks. And we thought that, we thought maybe we could trigger this remotely and open a door. And in this situation, we were in a satellite location where we had like, it was very, it was very, um, Hollywoody, right? Like we were like, we had to jump over a barbed wire fence and do all whatever, moving the security cameras, all this stuff. And when we got to the door, we called back, uh, you know, on, on radio to, to Overwatch and we were like, okay, we're, we're at the door. And like the, the guy sitting back behind the keyboard and he goes, all right, opening the door. And it went beep and it went green. <laughs> and we just kind of looked at each other and we were like, no way. No one got this on like, video. <laughs> like, like th that just happened. Like, I mean, it was the most like Hollywood nonsense that that we'd ever done. And um, it just it was really really satisfying to be like somebody three miles away just triggered this door and it let us in. And so yeah, we were just like, I can't believe that actually worked. And we had cloned badges, so we were ready to go in anyway, right? But just standing there going, open the door, and then <laughs> boop, we're like, no. I told you we should have brought the GoPros. <laughs> yeah, totally. I was somewhat insulted. I thought you were going to go for the fingerprints. You know, I thought about that right after I said that story. Because that's my story, not that's the fingerprint good. one. Because okay. it wasn't me, it right. was you. But, yeah. So um, I can't provide too much backstory because that'll take more than five minutes or two minutes now, if that. Um, at at St. Con, there's a contest called The Vault. Um, and the first year that it was run um, by Nate and Chunk, um, you had to break in and you got into this box and you got a tamper evident bag out of it. You didn't know what was in it. So the, the idea was to try and open up the tamper evident bag without someone noticing and you had to return it. And inside the tamper evident bag was a USB stick. And the USB stick 
contained, um, I think it was a dump of Etsy shadow or something like that, and you had to grab that, crack it, and, and provide the password to win. Well, we didn't want to open the bag because we weren't very good at tamper evident, and so we said, well, why don't we just tap the USB stick through the bag? Like, is that possible? I remember that. We didn't know if it was possible, so we're like, well, what would it need? Well, probably some like lancing needles. Where can we get those Walmart? Okay, we've got to strip apart a USB cable, and we, what wires do we even use? We should have read the USB spec prior to doing this, by the way. Um, so we were able to do it, and we had to create a jig to like get through the tamper evident bag and find out how to like tap the, the contacts. And without, you have to find a spot in the bag that it wasn't going to be noticeable because it was probably going to burn the bag. And when we're hooking it up, we're, we're, able, we're getting USB connectivity, and we didn't know how long we had or, or, or how much we had to stay on the contact. So I'm trying to refresh it and trying to copy down the data off the USB stick. And, and Henry, who was with us, he was holding the, the needles. And, and of course, Dark Matter was, was involved, as he usually is. And, and he's over there um, screaming at all of us, actually. Well, what we didn't realize was USB has um, a gauge of wire requirement spec. I think it's like 26 gauge wire or whatever, and the Lansing needles were not that. So as we're communicating with the USB stick trying to pull this data off, the Lansing needles are burning hot and burning his Henry's fingers. And so he's still holding them trying to maintain contact. I refresh it. It pops up as a USB device. I mount it and extract it, and we get the, the password file off the USB through the tamper evident bag before we burn the cable. And we and Dark Matter was able to crack it in like five seconds. So that's, that's, that's probably so the gangster. Yeah. Like you that did all gangster. that for for a contest. For know? a contest. But the point of that being that aha moment, we had no idea. We everyone just you just pushed yourselves to just what can we do? And that's where you get the biggest aha moments. I can't believe that worked. Yeah. Try things you don't think are possible and you'll get that. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I think we can adjourn. I'd like to thank all three of my friends for uh, being up here. It's good to see you all, and more conversations in the hallway for sure. Thanks, thanks for having us. HallwayCon next. Thank you. See you. Thank you.